so today's Friday and I think it's going to have to be throwback Friday uh, for this Heath kit power supply we've had the first wave of parts there's been a lot of discussion behind the scenes on isolation and earthing as we saw before this isn't earth and I'm not going to do that because it would alter it and what we're going to do is going to run this off an isolation transformer now the theory here is that the transformer in here is already an isolation transformer so theoretically it is isolated but supposing this uh, 1960 something transformer broke down and it puts one of the high voltages to chassis then of course you're in danger of being electrocuted so um, I think the best course of action is in fact to use this with an isolation transformer and to that end we are going to do that uh, so I want the radio to have an earth if you've ever built yourself a crystal set um, as a boy or even as an adult well, that was very sexist as a child because I know we've got uh, 0.6% of female viewers so if you connected your crystal set to a mains type of earth then certainly where I used to live in Yorkshire um, the results were atrocious but if you actually put a stake in the ground um, and did an earth that way then the results were good so taking that theory from my childhood I still want to do the stake in the ground earth um, and so in that case we're going to have this isolated so there's no cause no uh, reason to be killed by it now I did while I was waiting for capacity I didn't couldn't say that I was being waiting for capacity from RS components they've only taken a day to arrive um, and I was I've been able to get this one and I've, I've got that to replace it so it's what they call axial when the leads come out of the end it's axial when the leads come out of the bottom it's radial so these two um, they are 20 microfarads at 150 volts and we're replacing those with 22 microfarads at 160 volts being the nearest. You always go slightly up if you need to do that. And these huge capacitors here on the top, the replacement for those are these. And I managed to get them the same diameter so hopefully they'll fit in somewhere near and hopefully they won't waggle about like these do not that that matters but uh, there we go so look at the size difference between now and all those years ago and that's 150 at 450 volts so I did check just as a just as a random check I checked those two capacitors with the ESR meter and the right hand one is still working and the left hand one said leaky and as a test I tested that one and it says it works well anyway they're all coming out and they're all going to be replaced because at this age that's what needs to happen so with the soldering iron on I'm going to start that little job So meanwhile, the next day, this is where we got to the previous day with the three capacitors there, which of course are much smaller than what came out. I did measure the capacitors on our ESR meter and they were all getting there in some way or the other one was exceeding, one of these was was very poor state, the other one was more or less working but um, I think that one had dropped somewhat, that had dropped a lot and was leaky. And the bigger one around the corner there was getting high and when capacitors are coming to the end of their life the value seems to go high uh, when we took it out you could hear the works if you shook it you could hear the works wrapping around in the case and I've got a big hole now because I've taken that capacitor out and I can see how they're mounted now um, what I've done is to hurriedly order some capacitor clips 
because we're putting these capacitors in, which are going to look ridiculous, but they, <laughs> um, so they fit nicely because I've got the right um, diameter, but the trouble is, how would you mount them? You could clamp it between two bits of variable, I suppose. What I've done is to order some capacitor clips so they'll clip into, into those properly. They'll come about 2.30 this afternoon. It's currently seven o'clock in the morning. So what we'll do is we'll get on with something else, which is part of this. And this is to make up the connector cord between the radio and that power supply. So here is a kit of parts, which I got from the United States. I think it was $36, so don't think this is ever going to be free. We can get these sockets in the UK, obviously we can get the cable, but we can't get, I can't get the plug, so if anyone knows of a UK source of the 11 pin octal style plug, um, I'd be quite happy to know. They're very easy to get, and I have those in stock in bulk. RS do them for re the relay sockets. So I like the way these are in, in two halves, these um, things. There's nothing worse. I think we've all been there. When you beautifully put a plug on a, um, on a cable, especially when it's got 11 connections, and then you've discovered you've not put the boot on, and you think, oh no, and you've got to unsolder one end, and it's never quite as good the second time around. So I'm going to go about soldering these together, and I have the manual. ordered this from a chap in Germany. It's a rather nice Scannon print. So we have here the assembly of this cable and it starts off by telling you how much of the insulation he's taking off, goes through all the steps, which colour wire goes to which pin and so on. So we shouldn't have any problems in getting that wrong. Because, you know, you think, well, I can buy a Heath kit whatever for whatever money. Let's say you, you, you get to what I did for um, some knockdown price like £50. And then you've got a power supply to buy. <laughs> and that is going to cost money. And you can't expect it to plug in and switch on. So this, these remedial things need doing before you can start. So it's not a cheap way of getting on the air but it's a repairable way of getting on the air. And I, I've said before, I'm always concerned, because I like buying things for life. Uh, I'm always concerned that if you buy something which is really sophisticated, um, it might have some useful features. We've seen this in CBs, haven't we? We've, some of the latest sets have got a ridiculous number of, of wonderful features which you're never going to use. Um, but when we actually get them on the test equipment, there aren't that many that perform as as well as some of the better ones from 1981. And I, I see this with, with amateur radio as well. New, buying a new uh, piece of ham kit for 5,000 quid isn't necessarily going to work better than one you bought in uh, 1966, but it will have more features. So, and be smaller. So I'll pause the video at that and we'll go about putting this together. There we go with the first end, which has been cut from the sheath an inch and a quarter, and then the conductors five eighths of an inch. So now it's a matter of <clears throat> following what goes where, and it says we start with the black wire, which goes to pin two. And it seems like we start with the plug end. This is clearly new old stock. <laughs> because I can see the <laughs> debris down there. So it's, it's definitely an amphenol. So the black to pin two. And that 
is what? One, two. It's a matter of it going all the way through and then soldering it on, on the pin. And uh, it's just slightly too fat to actually come through on this one, so with some careful soldering that will solder in properly with what they call capillary action. So we'll just do that. Okay, so we've put the cable together. So the mystery um, around the um, the hundred the minus one hundred and thirty bias. It's pin one if the radio needs minus one hundred and thirty bias. This is the green wire, or it's pin eleven if it requires an adjustable bias. But we're using we're going to be configuring this for the HW12A. And so it is a fixed 130 minus 130 volt bias. So that's been done to pin one. Then the other mystery uh, was pin six or pin eight for the red wire, the, the thick red wire, which is the uh, valve heaters. And it turns out that the radio requires pin six for 12 volt operation. And so if we look in the other manual, when we find the right page you've got the wiring for the appropriate things minus 130 and filament is 12 volts we've now got to check with the power supply that it's set for 250 volts on its low high tension because it's 800 volts on its high high tension so that's the thing we've got to check inside the power supply see you although these ra this radios come with this power supply it doesn't mean that it's ever worked with it it doesn't even mean it's 230 volts for the UK so I've got to take all these precautions to make sure that this power supply is configured with this radio so it's now a matter so that was that one I found that uh, cutting a little bit more sheath off uh, got those in fine that's the other end and all but uh, two of those I've put sleeving on just to help um, so we now need to put the cable shrouds on and you know these you see these cables coming up on eBay and I, I even bid on one for a lot of money and uh, you know, yes, so it's cost thirty odd dollars and plus a pile of posts to ring it in. You know, it's, there probably won't have much been much change out of forty pounds by the time I've had this. Plus, I've got to put this work into it to wire it up. But at least it, I know it's going to work. The trouble with buying a a cable uh, that's um, you know fifty years old is has it got a break in it, and is it even configured for the rig that you're using? Because it's not just it's not just one wire to one wire, it depends what the rig needs. So I'm going to make sure that we label this uh, with a Dymo label that it's for the um, the Heathkit HF12W. So we get it right. Now are these the same or are they different? No, they're the same. So I'll put these together and I'll show you the finished result. Okay, so there we are all put together. So we've got the plug, we've got the socket, and I've made sure that I've got my needle file to the pins, where a bit of solder's gone onto the pin, that I have removed that so we're not uh, going to expand the socket to which it's connected. So let's just see whether it mates up to its own connector. And the answer is it does, so that's, that's a jolly good start. The only difficulty I had with that cable is you're expected to have a white wire in there, and they're in fact two reds. So I've had to use, there's a thin red, there's a thick red. So the thick red is obviously for the valve heaters. So that's what I've used. And the thin red I've substituted for the white. So all the other colors matched up and at least I know what I'm doing with it. So that's it. Right, so we've done that. So now we need the power supply back on the bench. And of course I'm still waiting for these capacity, the clips to turn up to continue with this but what I do need to check is if it's configured for um, 250 volts high tension or if it's configured for is it 285 volts high tension something like that I just need to check that to make sure 
we're applying the right volts. So I have here the notes wiring for oh, it's 300 volts or wiring for 250 volts. So I need to just check that that's how it's been done or that's how it's been done and reverse it accordingly. So we'll get the service manual back out and we need to the diagram which shows us the lugs. And again, we have no idea what whether it has been used with that rig or it hasn't. So this is to make sure. So it's looking for lug two of terminal G. So I'll just swap glasses. Lug two, terminal G. So terminal G is that one that runs across. So they expect you to have the transform on the right, which we have. So lug two of terminal G. And lug two is actually from the right. So let's have a look. Uh, let's pop the camera down a bit. Especially if I can find the camera's remote. So, lug two, terminal G. So we are. In fact, I use the red, the yellow tool to point. So we need to make sure that wire connect a five and a half inch blue wire from lug two of the electrolytic capacitor J. That's the one we've taken off down there. lug two and we went to lug four of terminal strip D and terminal strip D is the one up there so it's got to be a wire from there up to lug four of terminal D and lug four is the one second to the end Yes. And we haven't got that. So that's something I'm going to have to add in. So let's look at it the other way around. Had it been wired for 300 volts, it would have been connected to a two and a quarter inch blue wire from lug two of electrolytic capacitor J, which is that one, to lug two of terminal strip G. So that blue wire was for 300 volts, and this rig requires 250. So you see, this is why you have to check these things. So let's unsolder that. Or are we going to end up snipping it off? It's been nicely wrapped around. And I'm going to find some solder. Ooh, ooh, ooh. We'll just redo that. Joy and have it. There we go. Yes, right. Well, I mean, we don't even know if this is 110 volts or not. It doesn't say so. <laughs> you know, one would have thought it did, but it doesn't. But it does say the E version, and is that E for Europe? And I just, am I just making up things here? I don't know. So we'll be powering this up on 110 volts. What happens if somebody's powered this up on 230 and it's 110 volts supply and it's now destroyed the transformer? That's going to be an interesting cost. So. We need to now include that wire. So, solder uh, lug two of terminal strip G. Um, yeah. 
So we'll do that behind the scenes and uh, hopefully we'll put the record back on when I start putting these capacitors back in. Okay, so now we fast forward to Saturday. So we started this Thursday evening and spent about four or five hours on Saturday, on Friday with it. And we spent about four hours on it today. And as far as I can see, it's now finished. So, quick explanation of what's been going on. So we've got new capacitors in mounting clips, so they have to be drilled for. Some of the, two of the capacitors, the negative goes to earth. Two of the capacitors, the negative is isolated. So some of these nylon screws holding things together, and some are conductive screws. Now because the original capacitors Well, most of these have snapped off. You've got the positive there, and you've got four lugs, which are the negative. Well, Heathkit make use of those lugs as earthing points or, or connection points for the negative. So two of these holders are Paxilin, and two of these are metal. So clearly, the negative's earthed on those two, whereas the negative is going to be hot on those two. So it needs isolating. So what we've got are those nylon. Uh, nuts and bolts, we've got a bolt down to the deck, we've got a metal um, solder tag and then we've got another nylon bolt because we still need to retain these connection points but of course I've now had to run a wire to the negative. So I cut out the resistors, it was much easier to take it apart by just cutting out the resistors so they can be thrown away, we've put brand new ones in they're 100k at 2 watts so that's not a problem at all now I still don't know whether this is a 110 volt power supply or whether it's a 230 volt power supply I don't know what this is, it goes to the neon, it doesn't go to where the neon says in the, in the manual but there's two wires together it just makes me wonder whether this is a 230 volt transformer and that would be 115 uh, 0115 tapping joined together to run the 115 volt warning light so there is that possibility but I think we're going to power this up on 110, 115 volts or whatever whilst putting this together I photocopied the some bits of the manual and I ticked it off in the Heath kit way if we can find page 11 and I put a tick in the box if I'd done it or a tick in the box if it had been done by somebody else and was satisfactory to the best of my knowledge so quite a few points to go through which would take some hours to do so that's all the seven capacitors changed and those four resistors changed but the point is it's mechanically very stable uh, and and it's previous the previous those lugs on these capacitors they're pretty flimsy to be honest but then the other thing that worries me is that part number on there is for the is in shown in this manual as the part number for the transformer and this is of course for 110 volts so who knows so it's configured now for the radio I want to use the um, AW12A so it's 250 volts high tension. I made that cord, uh, connecting cord up as you saw, and it's configured for the HW12A. I, I see these on eBay for, you know, for 49 quid, second hand with the wires grinning out of them, and you don't know what radio it's configured for anyway, so you've still got to take it apart. So, part of me is concerned there's a 13 amp plug on American type cable, so we're going to find out. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get out our 230 volt to 230 volt isolation transformer. So here we have an isolation transformer which is the normal 13 amp plug, and the normal UK 13 amp socket on it, 
and he's a 375 watt all day isolation transformer. We have a couple of these and uh, the other one is in our church organ building kit because there's times we need to use mains vacuum cleaners um, on site and it's a bit safer of course to do that with one of these. So that's the isolation transformer and we're going to plug that in right now. So the next thing we're going to do is to plug into that our 110 volt, 115 volt transformer, which you can see inside is a toroidal transformer and is one kilowatt rated. There's a snag, and then there's always a snag, isn't there? Of course, the output socket on it is for an American type plug. So that's going to be interesting. Can I find some kind of adapter? So we'll pause the video while I see if I can find some kind of adapter. Okay, so we are now powered up. Um, so, well, it hasn't blown up or blown any fuses, so that's a good idea. Now that's the 12 volt, which will be the AC for heaters, and it's reading three. So this should be the 6 volt one, which if, if this is running half voltage is... four, five. Okay, so let's look at the... Oh, I'm, ah, filament commons there. No wonder I'm getting funny readings. So that's 12 volts. That's reading half ish. Bearing in mind this is offload. So this is the six volt one, which is just over half. It's of course offload. So if we go to ground and then switch to Oh, this meter doesn't go up there. Oh. Well, because we're running at half voltage, because I'm on 115, chances are that the 250 volt line will, it won't be half because it's off load, but it'll, it should be within the meter's capability. So we'll go into there. Yeah, 149. But the half of the 850 volt line would be still be too much for the meter. So now we'll look at the bias. Minus 130 it should be. So it should be half that. Minus 70. So it looks like it is a 230 volt model. Let's get another meter. I mean, back when I was in the telly days, because we had to have, have the Evo 8s. <laughs> Mind you, were there many digital ones? Um, so we'll swap the meter now for the little RS one. This does 600 volts on its top AC scale, and that shouldn't be a problem because we're running at half volts on DC. Yeah, half of that. Half of that. And this should be about 400. Yeah. Wow. What I intend doing is with the power supply like this, running at half voltage, I intend connecting up the HW12A transceiver to it. So I'll switch off the step down transformer and we'll pause the video. So here we have the HW12A. That's its front, that's its underneath. It all looks very nicely made. And if you think that's a spare valve socket, it's only for a crystal calibrator. So you can see the power connector on the back is the 11 pin. Uh, one we've been making up 
and I want to change this paper capacitor but it's not in stock at the wholesaler so we're just going to have to see what happens. I don't like cardboard 1966 electrolytics at 450 volts. So what we're going to do is make sure this is switched off. Go with a nice cable that I made up. So we're now plugged into the power supply and we'll switch on the transformer. Right, well nothing's blown up. Let's see if I can put this in a position where we can possibly see the dial lights. So this remember is going to all be running at half voltage because we're running off a 115 volt transformer and we're now going to switch it on and we've got a dial light Okay, so we now have a speaker connected up. Again with crocodile clips because it's the wrong kind of connector. So you buy all this stuff together but it doesn't all fit together. Come on. And the dial lights are lit up. So hopefully in about 20 seconds we may get some kind of hum or something, remember we're at the wrong voltage. It may just be enough for us to see there's no short circuits. Yes, I can see the valves lit. Let's give it a bit of aerial, just in case there's enough voltage for it to do something. When we're going to have to turn it off just to see what the uh, sockets are. <laughs> okay, so it's a belling lead plug. Well, all we can do there is a crocodile clip from underneath, if we've got any left. Push back on, this time with just our CB aerial in the connector see what if anything happens Okay, so we can't uh, hear anything at half volts, and before I move any further, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that the volts on this radio are what that socket says at the back. So I'm going to have to um, get the service manual out and make a note of everything that's there, and make sure it's half what it should be. So if it isn't, because what, what's just giving me a bit of a niggle 
is that this dial light looks the right brightness to me. That doesn't look like it's half brightness. And the valves, I don't think you can even see them yourselves. Um, they look lit at the right amount. So, <laughs> ah, hang on a minute, we've got a valve dislodged. I'll just switch off and switch back on again. bent pins not good now these aren't series strung this is why it's um, it's 12 volt valve heater on this for 6 volt valves so after I'll look how that's wired it's probably a pair of valves to, uh, in, in series to make that work so I'll switch it back on again just to make sure there's no change and like CB radios, it has an annoying concentric RF attenuation and the volume control. Anyway, I certainly can't hear anything from the speaker. We're running at half volts, so we'll take it to We'll take it from there. So that's your part two. There is no short on that power supply and there's no short on this radio. So we are heading in the right direction. So hope it's all interesting for you as we resurrect this uh, elderly, uh, it will be 1966, it's certainly the date code on the uh, capacitors I took out. And it's something to bear in mind that when you buy a, even a batch of stuff, because there's more than one transceiver in this batch. This type of power supply, the um, HP23 from Heathkit, although it can be used with all the radios they did on the whole, uh, not some of the earlier ones, but initially it was the... Uh, oh dear, they had Indian tribe names, didn't they? Uh, and they do use a different power supply, but most of the others use this uh, PS23 in its various uh, guises. And it goes to show that as you've seen me do this you've got to configure it when you build it for whether you want 250 or 300 volts high tension so you can't just buy a Heathkit radio buy a Heathkit power supply and plug the two in because you've not only got that but you've also got to configure the interconnecting lead which I made as to whether it's 12 volt heaters or 6 volt heaters and although this is 6 volt heaters in the radio it runs on 12 so you know it, it's, that's how it's wired and you've also got to know whether you've got your bias which is going to be uh, fixed at minus 130 volts or whether it's adjustable from the power supply and you see this is it so you buy these second hand fly leads and maybe totally unsuitable in the new re your vintage radio so everything's here is being done very carefully and with those manuals so uh, thank you for watching Heathkit part 2